All right, welcome back everybody. Today I wanna to talk about the idea that when you go into grad school, you should think about setting up a software workflow. If you're in STEM or if you're in a social sciences field, you probably need to analyze some data, create some figures from that data, write a long manuscript about it, which includes dozens of citations, and then you're gonna do that whole process over again. So today let's talk about that software workflow, which is gonna make that whole process more efficient. As I mentioned, you have all these tasks you need to accomplish in order to execute a research project. In my next few videos, I wanna talk specifically about what software you might wanna use and sort of the pros and cons. But right now I wanna talk about the big picture and selecting a set of software that works really well together. All right, so take a look at this framework for a hypothetical project. This figure is from Brian Kennett's book, Planning and Managing Scientific Research, A Guide for the Beginning Researcher. I'll put a link to it in the description because it's available freely online. Here we have a project with some experimental work, some field work, some modeling slash data analysis work, and then some writing work. If you're working in a laboratory setting or you're outside doing field work, you probably have someone with you mentoring you for the first time, teaching you how to do it. Same thing with your writing. You're gonna have an advisor who's reading your writing and giving you lots of feedback as you exchange drafts back and forth. But for some low-key modeling work where we're doing some data analysis to help us interpret our lab work or our field work, you might be less likely to have someone who's willing to sit down with you and walk you through that whole process and explain to you how to do it. You might get told what to do, but you might also get sent off to figure it out yourself over the next week. So you want some sort of system of software which can take you from having data from your lab experiments or your field sites to generating figures from those data to putting those figures in a manuscript and including all of the references and citations to the stuff you've read along the way. Let's take a look at an example of what that kind of workflow might look like. So for a lot of the work that I do, I use MATLAB and I do that for my data analysis. Once I've created a whole bunch of code in MATLAB, I put it up on GitHub and I generate a code release the nice thing about putting all your code on something like GitHub is that you can also generate a DOI that goes along with the code release. That just means it's something that's citable. Because I'm in earth science and I make a lot of maps, I prefer to make my figures in this program called Generic Mapping Tools. So this is really good if you're making a lot of maps with different map projections. That's kind of what it's designed for. So I just have MATLAB generate some text files of my data, which I can read into GMT. Of course, along the way of this project, I've done a whole lot of reading of the literature, and anytime I read something I think I want to save, I enter it into my bibliography. So I keep my bibliography in a program called bibdesk, and bibdesk generates a bibtech file. When I actually start writing, where I want to put in all my text and my citations and my equations, I start putting that into an article file. Now what I'm actually using for document creation is LaTeX. Now LaTeX isn't actually a program, it's a language. So because I do most of my work on Macs, I'm using a program called TechShop that includes a distribution of LaTeX and also some other programs. So for example, BibDesk is included in the TechShop distribution. So all the things I've made so far, the figure PDFs, the references which are in my bibliography, all of the text which is in my article file, it all gets compiled together by LaTeX in order to generate a document. And so it's creating this article.pdf. Oh, and I almost forgot. The nice thing about getting DOIs for your code release is that you can put them in BigDesk and then they show up as citations in your article. So in this workflow, there's a clear path on how everything gets included in the article that I'm writing. By the way, if you're finding this useful, a subscribe to my channel would also be pretty useful. So here's another example of a workflow. This one is from Kieran Healy's book, The Plain Person's Guide to Plain Text Social Science. This book is also freely available online and I've linked it in the description. This book has really compelling arguments for developing good research habits and a lot of good information on how to do that. This diagram looks a bit complicated, but there's really only two parts to it. Knitter and Pandoc are both programs for assembling different pieces of your article. Knitter is meant to help you integrate your writing with your R code into a single document formatted in Markdown. Pandoc is a document converter which can take Markdown and create different documents like HTML files, PDFs, or docx format. Overall, it's just another way of doing similar things to the example that I showed before. Again, in both of these examples, there are clear paths for bringing things, such as figures, into your final document. So why might you want to use systems like the one I just described? Well, there's a couple reasons. First, these programs are free and they're open source. 
This is not 100% true for MATLAB, but I have some pretty specific work reasons for using MATLAB for the things I do. Also, Octave is a free and open source MATLAB clone that can run most MATLAB code without any changes. Anyway, second, these programs have the ability to be streamlined or automated. If I'm nine months into a project and I get some new data points, I wanna be able to update my data structure, rerun my whole analysis, generate some figures from that automatically, and have it recreate the PDF without any problem. The examples that I just showed can do that, mostly as a result of the fact that they operate in a scripting environment. Third, these programs are easily portable, they're well documented, and anything that you make with them is easily reproducible. This is really important if we want to create an open science environment that has more transparency and increases the speed at which everyone can do work. Finally, last but not least, these programs are all intended to work together, so they all have much better integration between them. If you're a new grad student or you're starting grad school soon, you wanna ask yourself, what am I actually using now to do this whole process? Then you wanna ask yourself, do I need a workflow that is gonna last at least five years? And then you wanna reflect on it and say, is my current workflow up to that task? Is it gonna be robust enough so that five years from now, the things that I produce are still gonna be serving me well? The beginning of your grad school career is the perfect time to invest some time up front to make your work more efficient later on. All right, I hope this was helpful. Thanks for watching. As I said, my next couple videos are gonna be about more specific software products that we might wanna use and the pros and cons in those decisions. So stay tuned and I'll see you next time.